This week marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Mike Hodges' Flash Gordon, a movie that critic Nathan Rabin famously described as looking like it was shot by a sentient bag of cocaine. Next week would have seen the release of the first cinematic adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune since that of director David Lynch in 1984. Taken together, these bright and colourful epics produced by Dino De Laurentiis offer an interesting snapshot of where mainstream big-budget cinematic science fiction was in the 1980s, particularly as framed in opposition to George Lucas' Star Wars. Of course, there were a lot of interesting things happening in cinematic science fiction during the 1980s, including films like Terry Gilliam's Brazil and Paul Verhoeven's Robocop. Ridley Scott would redefine the genre with his work on Alien in 1979 and Blade Runner in 1982, two of the most influential science fiction films ever made. However, Flash Gordon and Dune stand out among the decade science fiction as an effort to construct crowd-pleasing science fiction spectacle to compete directly with Star Wars. Scott, who was briefly attached to Dune, conceded that directing it would be a step very, very strongly in the direction of Star Wars. There were other connections as well. George Lucas had only developed Star Wars when De Laurentiis refused to sell him the rights to Flash Gordon. While Lynch's work on The Elephant Man was cited as the reason that he was hired to direct Dune, it's notable that he turned down the chance to direct Return of the Jedi. I kind of crawled into a phone booth and phoned my agent and I said, there's no way, no, no way I can do this. And he said, you just lost, I don't know how many millions of dollars. Critics have long noted the overlap between the Star Wars saga and religious experience, as demonstrated by the number of people identifying their religion as Jedi. Bill Moyer has argued that Star Wars resonated on a religious level, in part because, by the end of the 1970s, the hunger for spiritual experience was no longer being satisfied sufficiently by the traditional vessels of faith. As such, it makes sense that films emulating Star Wars would draw more overtly from that religious subtext. For a time, the biblical epic was one of the default modes of Hollywood blockbuster, comparable to the ubiquity and popularity of the western or the musical. To pick an example, Samson and Delilah was the highest grossing movie of 1949 by some margin, earning more than three times as much as its closest competitor. At the time of its release, it was the third highest grossing movie of all time, behind only Gone with the Wind and the Best Years of Our Lives. It was not an outlier. Quo Vadis and David and Bathsheba were the two highest grossing movies of 1951. The Robe was the second highest grossing movie of 1953, while its sequel, Demetrius and the Gladiators, was the third highest grossing movie of 1954. These movies solidified Charlton Heston as a star, with The Ten Commandments and Ben-Hur being the highest grossing movies of 1956 and 1959 respectively. Westerns often serve as a stock point of comparison for the modern superhero blockbuster, but there's a lot to be said about the genre as an extension of the religious epic that was popular during the 1950s, particularly in terms of production design and spectacle. This is most obvious when looking at fantastical or imagined worlds, like those featured in Thor Ragnarok, Man of Steel, or Wonder Woman. But it's also obvious when looking at the epic battle scenes, the climax of movies like Infinity War and Endgame. However, the biblical epic entered a decline during the 1960s. There were several reasons for this. Most obviously, the scale and budget of these movies expanded to a point where they could no longer survive in the marketplace. The non-religious historical epic Cleopatra was both the highest grossing movie of 1963 and one of Hollywood's most notorious flops. John Huston's The Bible, coincidentally produced by De Laurentiis himself, was the highest grossing movie of 1966, but it cost so much that it failed to turn a profit. Hollywood itself was changing around the genre. The old studio system that churned out these sorts of epics was eroding towards the end of the 1960s, giving way to the new Hollywood movement. The future of religion and cinema probably looked more like the grounded Italian neorealism of Pasolini's The Gospel According to St. Matthew than any of the more traditional religious epics. Hollywood was not necessarily interested in making movies on that scale, in that style, any longer. Of course, the new Hollywood movement would not last. Following several embarrassing financial failures, like William Friedkin's Sorcerer, Martin Scorsese's New York, New York, and Michael Cimino's studio Killing Heaven's Gate, the studios began to push back against the idea of auteur directors. Looking for a more stable and rewarding model of film production, they looked to emulate the success that Steven Spielberg had enjoyed with Jaws, what George Lucas had seen with Star Wars. Thus began the era of the blockbuster. Initially, it seemed like Hollywood studios didn't entirely understand this new mode of filmmaking, and so reflexively returned to the language and trappings of their older successes that had operated at a similar level. As such, it makes sense that films like Flash Gordon and Dune would look and feel so much like the biblical epics of decades earlier. This is obvious looking at the production of these films. Star Wars was at the cutting edge of a special effects revolution, with Lucas himself founding industrial light and magic to realize his vision. In contrast, the special effects of films like Flash Gordon and Dune hark back to an older style of movie making, 
This is most obvious in how the ships fly and glide in Dune, often looking like they've been lifted directly from a classic science fiction movie like The Day the Earth Stood Still. Similarly, parts of Dune were shot using an outdoor blue screen. The production team acknowledged that this was unconventional by contemporary standards, however, it had been standard for classic biblical epics. Rejecting the used future aesthetic of Star Wars, a lot of Flash Gordon and Dune unfold in grand palaces and stately surroundings. Large halls with grand columns, in beautiful colours. While Star Wars begins after the Jedi have fallen, Flash Gordon and Dune feature regally costumed characters wandering through lavish and spacious sets. Quick sidebar here. Although the original Star Wars trilogy arguably pushed special effects forward and arguably past 1950s biblical epics, it's notable that these movies ended up being a huge touchstone for George Lucas's prequel trilogy. In particular, the pod racing sequence in The Phantom Menace and the gladiatorial climax in Attack of the Clones both draw very heavily from the language of 1950s cinema. It seems somewhat ironic that Lucas only seems to go back to the genre when looking back nostalgically to the 1950s, then again, the prequels draw most heavily from 1950s film serials, in contrast to the 1930s influences of the original trilogy. But hey, that's probably a discussion for another time, so let's end sidebar and move on. This 1950s nostalgia made sense. Though rooted in the 1930s, Flash Gordon had enjoyed a revival in popularity in television in the 1950s. Although Dune was published in 1965, David Lynch has an acknowledged fondness for the decade of the 50s, conceding that that decade is just about it for him. More than that, this captured something of the general mood, as a palpable nostalgia for the 1950s ran through the 1980s, reflected in pop culture like Back to the Future, The Wonder Years, and Stand By Me. Indeed, those movies tap so firmly into the zeitgeist that President Ronald Reagan, himself a movie star from the middle of the century, would even explicitly quote Back to the Future in his 1986 State of the Union address. As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where we're we going, we don't need roads. Flash Gordon had originally been conceived as something of a space-age biblical epic. Before director Mike Hodge stepped onto the project, original director Nick Rogue and writer Michael Allen had originally conceived of this film as an allegory for the Garden of Eden. Flash and Dale were Adam and Eve, Ming was an evil deity chasing them across the universe. Even in the finished version of the film, the audience is introduced to Ming the Merciless as something equivalent to an angry deity, ravaging the earth with natural disasters and acts of God for his own amusement. The religious subtext in Dune is more obvious, with Paul Atreides explicitly positioned as a religious figure. Frank Herbert drew much of the story's mythology from a variety of Christian, Islamic, Jewish, and Buddhist sources. Even before Paul is named as the Mahdi, House Atreides is openly religious. May the hand of God be with you. May the hand of God be with us all, Duncan. As the movie ends, when Paul makes it rain on Atrakis, it is equivalent to Moses parting the Red Sea in the Ten Commandments. Notably, Max von Sydow appears in both films playing Ming the Merciless in Flash Gordon, and planetologist Laid Kynes in Dune. Both of these figures play archetypal religious roles in the narrative. Ming as a vengeful god, and Kynes as John the Baptist to Paul's messiah in waiting. This casting seems important. Von Sydow had played Jesus Christ in The Greatest Story Ever Told, one of the last big studio biblical epics. Von Sydow is joined in Dune by Jose Ferreira, playing the role of Emperor Shaddam IV. Ferreira had played King Herod in The Greatest Story Ever Told another ruler who needs to kill a young messiah to secure his reign. If Flash Gordon aims to create something equivalent to an a-religious update of a classic biblical epic, then Dune offers something slightly more subversive. David Lynch takes the trope of the biblical epic and renders them unsettling and horrific. The imagery of Paul addressing his followers evokes the triumph of the will, as his young sister Alia dances in a burning wasteland surrounded by dead bodies. Towards the end of the film, Paul seems to break the world itself. The spectacle of Flash Gordon and Dune sharply contrasts with the actual and overtly religious films of the same period. Movies like Monty Python's The Life of Brian and Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ were notably smaller and more intimate in scale than classical biblical epics. The Life of Brian was a spoof, while The Last Temptation of Christ broke decisively with the biblical epic tradition. It goes without saying that both were controversial to religious audiences. With that in mind, it's interesting that these two early 80s attempts to create crowd-pleasing science fiction spectacle would draw so heavily from the tradition of the 1950s biblical epics, by stripping out much of the explicitly religious content while framing them as fantastical adventures. It might even be possible to connect the subversive use of the language of the biblical epic in Dune to the weirder breed of modern religious spectacles in movies like Noah and Exodus Gods and Kings. Still, at the dawn of the blockbuster age, Flash Gordon and Dune seemed to position blockbuster science fiction as something close to a secular religious epic. I've been Darren Mooney, and this was In the Frame.